techniques using speech recognition algorithms to predict whether and why a baby is crying. Number two, I have five children. I'm sure number one and number two are closely related. <laughs> uh, number three, I was a mathlete in high school, <laughs> which is actually was the name of the math club. I'm sure some of you have mathletes at your school too. So number one, who thinks that's true? Or false. Actually, which is a lie? Number one? All right. Number two. Ooh. Number three? Number two is a lie. I only have four. That's <laughs> okay. So today, I am going to be speaking about dynamic causal modeling, as soon as I can find full screen mode. And so dynamic causal modeling is um, an area which I became extremely interested in because I was interested both in um, issues surrounding functional connectivity, but then um, I saw that there was an obvious gap um, in regular functional connectivity analysis and that it didn't really assume that there was any sort of uh, stimuli that was affecting the brain. So for example, fun functional connectivity I thought was a wonderful way of analyzing resting state data. But if we're putting someone in the scanner and we know what time they're doing a task, why are we not integrating that information into our functional connectivity models? So dynamic causal modeling is a way of kind of working around that. So today I'm going to be talking about DCM for fMRI. Um, but there are also um, DCM methods that you can apply to EEG, which Dr. Douglas will be speaking about next. And I'm going to try to give more of a high-level conceptual overview of what DCM is now. And the reason for this is because um, I want to kind of um, give you some very practical insight into when and how and why DCM would be used. And um, any sort of methodological details, you can always look up an equation of paper. But if I haven't sold you on the product, you're not even going to bother reading the manual. So that's, that's what I'm uh, out to do right now. And uh, Dr. Douglas, I believe, will be taking more of uh, a similar approach, but also will have more focus on applications. And so um, the two talks will complement each other. And that is the reason why we're holding questions until the end, because there's a very, very good chance that whatever questions you have um, in the first talk will be answered within the first five minutes of the second talk. And you also get more coffee in between. So brain connectivity. So we're going to start off then talking about the different types of brain connectivity. So there's anatomical connectivity. Um, so what are the actual connections between the regions of the brain? The functional connectivity and effective connectivity, which is a little bit different. So connectivity, um, it's a central property of any system. So for example, there are many different ways we can, uh, and diff many different models of connectivity that we can um, analyze and look at. So for example, if we're looking at the way that signals are transferred over the internet, that's one sort of uh, connection network that we can analyze. Um, similarly, in social networks, we can also try to analyze in social networks, for example, how um, students are integrated in classrooms, how information is transferred across these networks. I recently did analysis of uh, students who had autism who were placed inside mainstream classrooms looking at how they formed and how they lost friendships over the course of the school year. And the metrics that were used in that social network analysis of autistic children uh, were largely the same as ones that have been used also in brain imaging. So clustering coefficients, transitivity, um, you can even get small world measures out of it. So when we're looking at connectivity, connectivity is a very practical uh, way of trying to analyze how the system is constructed and how to really optimize it. So anatomical and structural connectivity, as you know, is the presence of axonal uh, connections. So that's something you can use from animal studies or from tractography. We have some sort of prior knowledge about what regions we believe are going to be integrated with other regions. Functional connectivity. Functional connectivity, I believe you guys have had a lecture on that already. Um, it basically discusses what the statistical dependencies are between regional time series or, for example, you can look at the statistical dependencies among networks. And what these dependencies uh, measure usually is just some sort of lower order correlation. Perhaps you integrate a lag in it. Perhaps it's something like Granger causality. But in the context of graph theory, this would be looking at this more as an undirected network. We are looking at the relationship among two different time series, be they from regions of interest or from networks. And all we're doing is saying that there is some sort of relationship between these, between these entities of interest. But we're not saying 
which way it goes. We're not saying which one affects the other. There's no sort of causal interpretation of it. All we're saying is that these two things have some sort of relationship, some sort of affiliation. We don't know which one, though, is the driving force behind the processes. So effective connectivity then really differs from functional connectivity in that you're looking for directed or causal influences between neurons or normal populations. So what you're looking at when you're doing effective connectivity is you're looking to try to see if you perturb one region, do you see some sort of change in the other? You are assuming then that your input goes in one spot and then spreads throughout, or maybe can go to more than one spot and spread throughout, but you're not assuming your input affects all regions at the same time. So again, um, more examples of anatomical connectivity. Uh, you have neuronal communication via synaptic contacts, uh, and you can do visualization by tracing techniques, and uh, you can look at things like long-range axons and association fibers. And functional connectivity, you could do, for example, the seed voxel correlation analysis, eigen decomposition, ICA, or any other technique describing these dependencies among regional Titan series. So what are functional connectivities? Are they, are they the same as the coactivations that you see in SPM? So for example, if you run a GLM on, um, on a regular uh, fMRI scan and you see that there is these regions of the brain that appear to be active, does that mean that there's going to be functional connectivity between them? And the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is because um, functional connectivity um, is dependent largely, usually, upon the phase. And so, for example, if you have two signals here, you have your blue task and you have response A1 and response A2, these will show up as being uncorrelated with each other because of the phase that's in between them. So because these things are separated perfectly, when you look at the correlation between the two, you are not going to see any sort of relationship. So functional connectivity um, is not the same as whichever regions show up active when you do a GLM analysis. So there are pros and cons of functional connectivity. And it can be extremely useful when we have no idea what is going on. So we have no experimental control over the system of interest and no model of what caused the data. So for example, resting state. We have sleep and hallucinations as well. What we know is that something, um, there, there are some sort of activities going on in the brain, but we don't know why it's happening or how it's happening, and we have no idea of what sort of um, input the system is having into what the person is actually thinking. So the cons of uh, functional connectivity analyses is that interpreting the patterns can be difficult and somewhat arbitrary. And there's no mechanistic insight into the neural system of interest. So we're not putting in all we know about, for example, the stimuli or the axonal connections into the model. All we're doing is try to process uh, what we see uh, as the dependencies among these regions. And it's so because of this, it's usually suboptimal for situations where we have a priori knowledge and experimental control about the systems of interest. And because of these shortcomings, because we're not using any of our information about the stimuli, because we're not harnessing information that we know about um, the effective or, or about the um, axonal connections, how, the, the actual anatomy, then we need to do a little bit more sophisticated models, which are models of effective connectivity. So for understanding brain function mechanistically, we need effective connectivity. And those are models of causal interactions among neuronal populations. So some models for computing fMRI effective connectivity, um, structural equation modeling was done before, regression models, Volterra kernels, time series models, and dynamic causal modeling. So dynamic causal modeling was introduced in 2003 but, um, for fMRI by Carl Christen, Lee Harrison, and Will Penny. And it was part of the SPM software package. And there are more than, a lot more now than 100 published papers on DCM. So when we are talking about methods such as DCM, it can be very um, easy to pool DCM into kind of a GLM-ish framework. And the reason why it's so easy to do that is because, as I've said before, DCM uses the actual stimulus to infer uh, what sort of resulting activity should be seen in the brain. But there are a few key differences between DCM and GLM that I'm going to try to um, spell out a little bit more. So when you run a GLM, what you're doing is you're basically regressing what you know is your task stimulus against what you expect to see based on uh, the expected response in the hemodynamics. So you would do something where you say you, you convolve your boxcar function between three and six seconds, I was 
looking at that light, so I should see some activation of the visual cortex. You model that boxcar function with your expected hemodynamic response, and you get out some sort of um, p-values and cluster correction and all the wonderful stuff that falls along with that, which may not be so wonderful. Now, so you're making your inference, though, within the voxels. DCM is different, though, because you're not making the inference on a voxel scale. You're actually looking at the region of interest. So what you are doing is you're specifying a region of interest, and the signal that you're trying to predict isn't going to be the signal of the of a voxel or even the average signal of the region. What you're actually predicting is looking at the eigenvariate, so the principal time series that is found within that region. So DCM, your inference is upon the region and not upon the voxel. So also, when you're doing DCM, you're not making inference on the bold signal, you're looking at the actual neuronal activation. This is because when you're doing DCM, you're actually um, making hypotheses on what the dynamics are, and because of the modeling, you're inverting the model and going back to what the parameters should be, and you're making inference upon the activations. So s when you are performing GLMs and DCMs, you're also answering different questions. So GLM is useful for answering where the stimulus produced activation. And when you get this answer of where the activation was produced, you're not getting any sort of information about how it was pr produced. So for example, um, if you are doing some sort of uh, visual task, you would, see, um, you, you would see activation in different regions of the brain, but you wouldn't, for example, know where the stimulus reached first. So you wouldn't have any sort of idea of what was the first region uh, ex that was affected. It your model would basically assume that the visual stimuli affects the entire occipital cortex at the same time. So DCM then is a way to model how the stimulus activated the system of interconnected ROI. So for example, you would be able to spell out your model of the visual system and say, well, I expect this, the signal is going to hit um, at one input point and then propagate throughout rather than assuming as in a GLM that your signal is going to hit all areas at the same time. The final difference between these uh, two approaches is that Bayesian, um, Bayesian estimation is used to identify the most likely distribution of the parameters in DCM, whereas in G uh, GLM models, you're using frequentist estimation. So you're getting out your beta x prime x inverse x prime y out of it. So DCM, what you are looking at first then is you are looking at uh, your neural state equations. So you're looking at the change in activity, this is dx, with respect to time, and your modeling is a function of your current activity, your input, u, and then theta. So theta is going to be your uh, matrices that govern uh, the different sorts of connectivity you see along with your hemodynamic parameters. So in fMRI, um, if you have a simple neuronal model, there's a complicated forward model. Now DCM for fMRI, the basic idea is it's a bilinear state equation. So a cognitive system is modeled at its underlying neuronal level, which is not directly accessible for fMRI. So you are assuming that you are modeling the neuronal level um, and you are basically trying to uh, go back and identify the parameters of the model that would best explain your observed activity. The model neuronal dynamics X is transformed into area-specific bold signal by hemodynamic forward model. So the aim of DCM is to estimate parameters at the neuronal level such that the model bold signals are maximally similar to experimentally me measured bold signals. So then you have your activity then in your neural states that you're trying to model. And you also have your observed bold signal in the regions, why? So this would, for example, be um, the principal uh, component time series in a region of interest that you're interested in. And what you're trying to do then is you're trying to explain this activity that you see as a product of the intrinsic connectivity. So that would be things like um, your information that you have from tractography. Um, your direct inputs, so the U is a stimuli you're putting in, and then the relationship between these two. So for example, if you are performing a task and if uh, there is some sort of distractor or some change in attention that happens, you would be including that in your modulation of connectivity. So your, your uh, connectivity may change with some other sort of stimuli being introduced. So that would be things like change in attention, um, uh, applying TMS, changing the task. Um, you're able to do some sort of thing to change what you expect the input or how you expect the stimuli to affect uh, the dynamics. So the driving input then would be the actual main task that you're doing. 
and that goes into um, your C matrix, and the modulatory input is what the one that you hypothesize is going to change the connections. So right here, U2 would be something like a tension that you think may change the, the um, connection or connectivity between X1 and X3. And the driving input here, you would assume, goes into region X1. So if you uh, come from a bilinear, uh, from an engineering uh, background, you may rec recognize this as just being a Taylor series. So what you're doing then is you're doing a two-dimensional two, two Taylor series, um, and uh, this becomes a bilinear state equation. So this A matrix and B matrix and C matrix here are the same as these matrices here. And what you're looking at for A then is you're looking at A is the change of the state with respect to the past. So how does the past affect the present? And this can look at uh, the connectivity both from other regions feeding into it and the connectivity with itself. And the direct input looks at the change in the activity th with respect to the stimuli. So C is your um, matrix that defines how your inputs are going to change your actual response. So it, it describes the main effect of the stimuli. And B, as I mentioned before, is something like attention where you're actually modulating that connectivity. So then, when you write it out as a bilinear state equation, you're looking at the change in activity with respect to time, and you're modeling it as these series of matrices where A captures the intrinsic connectivity, and B is um, the connectivity that describes the modulation, and then C is the direct inputs. So here's an example, then, of how this model would play out if you're looking at a linear system of dynamics in the visual cortex. So, for example, um, we know that if you feed information to the right visual field, then it goes into um, the left lingual gyrus. You can model it as. It's, it's bypassing a few steps there. But also in the left visual field, it should go into the right lingual gyrus. Excuse me. I got confused by the extra L there. And so what a DCM model would do, for example, would be try to model each region here, so for example, the X1 region, as the sum of all the signals that should be received. So these could be the, si the signals that are received in the absence of the stimuli. So for example, here we see A11, X1. So the change in X that we see should be the change that we see um, with A with respect to itself. So whatever, um, whatever sort of activity you see in a region at a given time should be a function of what just happened before that. So this is kind of a way of looking at the memory of the region, what happened before and you can also model it as, um, or add to it, the contribution of the neighboring region. So this is x2 connects to x1, so you're going to have a12 times x2. So this is um, still the intrinsic connectivity. x2 is going to affect x1 because these are connected. And similarly, we see that x3 connects to x1, so you also have in your A matrix A13 multiplied on there. And then also here you have the effect of your input, which is C. So C12, U2 describes the effect that U2 has and how it feeds into here. Now, if you look into this model, you can compare these equations for X1 and X2 with X3 and X4, and you can see that they're missing this U. And this, again, goes back to the driving point behind DCM, which is that you're assuming that your inputs aren't affecting all regions directly. They have an indirect influence. So, for example, you would still see an effect of the fusiform gyrus with respect to the stimuli being applied, but this effect would be... Um, would be passed on to it from the lingual gyrus, according to this model. You would be saying that any sort of effect that the stimuli had on the fusiform gyrus would first be going to lingual gyrus and then traveling on that way. Or it could also travel around, but I don't think that would probably be a wise idea. So then you can change these equations then just to put them in matrix form, and this is how you would get it out. The change in X with respect to time is a product of your effective connectivity, with the state, and then the input parameters times the external inputs, and U is the task, as we said before here. So the theta matrix that you're looking at here is going to be estimated through doing the DCM. You're going to be estimating what the connections are, what these actual A values are, and also what these C values are. So C would be how strongly this task affects this region directly. And if you'll notice here, too, you'll see that like I said before, we are assuming that um, the stimuli only have input into a single region. This is for this specific model. You can always 
uh, be creative with it. Um, but because of that, these other parameters here are zero. So you're not estimating every single value from the matrix. You're really using what you think is going to be happening in the model based on, for example, your um, knowledge of brain connectivity to try to inform what parameters actually need to be estimated. So similarly then, if you want to add in, for example, your contextual input, things like your distractor task, you can put in your B matrix. So um, perhaps we should check on time. I don't have a timer up here. Is that? Okay, so I have 30, 20 minutes? I have 35 minutes? Okay. Okay, so then here is an example using simulated data, which is the best kind because you know where it came from and you don't have to deal with noise. So this is an example of how the model actually operates when you're looking at different regions. And so here we have our stimuli, U1, and it looks, um, it's a very brief, uh, very brief stimuli that people are exposed to. And then you have your U2 here, which is going to be a contextual. So perhaps um, someone is looking at a flash of light and then uh, between these two, time points right here, they are having uh, maybe a dog barking, um, C-SPAN playing, I don't know, something to distract and annoy them. So then what we want to do then is to try to model these equations and write out actually what it would be then. So we have here our value x1, and we know that the stimuli is going to be directly coming into there. And so because of that, we know that there is going to be a C1 value. So x1 is going to be receiving u1 when you multiply these two together. Similarly, um, we also know that X2 is going to be receiving both the connections with itself, so it's, int its own intrinsic connectivity, and it will be receiving also the stimuli indirectly from X1, and it also will be affected by the contextual inputs. So maybe then perhaps we want to see, no, I don't want to join UCLA Wi-Fi. Okay, so then we want to see then how these uh, signals propagate throughout, knowing that, for example, the stimuli is going to feed into X1. So right now at the very first part, you see what happens if we um, feed in the stimuli to uh, X1 through U1. So X1 has a very nice sort of exponential decay going on here, and X2 is also getting the signal indirectly, but it's having a little bit more of an irregular form. But if you put on your contextual variable, so if you're turning on what you think is your distractor task, then you're going to see this effect being modulated then. So this effect right here, if you look right here, there is sort of um, an inflection point right here where this uh, shape begins to decay more rapidly for X1 when you turn on your contextual variable. So your distractor task is going to lower your activity that you see in X1. Now, when you look at X2, it's getting two doses of the, your distractor task. It's getting it from X1, so U2 is feeding through here and going in here, and it's also getting it directly. And because of this, then U2 has a much stronger inhibitory effect on what you see in X2. So as you can see here, it's, it's, um, it's done a much greater job of dampening the system. And that's because you assume that your uh, contextual variable was affecting both regions. So then, what type of design, and this is um, not, not the uh, connectivity models, but what type of experimental design is good for DCM? And the answer to that is any design that is good for GLM of fMRI data. And this really can be um, uh, thought of as um, an argument for using designs such as uh, factorial designs, which tend to be the most powerful. So DCM, though, um, DCM tries to model the same phenomena as a GLM, just in a different way. And it's a model based on connectivity and its modulation for explaining experimentally controlled variants and local responses. And so before you do a DCM, you do a GLM. And this is because if a region isn't activated by the task, then it doesn't need to be included. Because when you're doing a DCM, what you're trying to do is, is trying to make inferences about how these driving inputs, about how these um, tasks change your entire system. So if something isn't affected within a GLM, then it, it's not included within a DCM. So if no activation in a region is included by a GLM, you don't include it inside a DCM. So that's how you select which regions you use. So if you're looking at multifactorial design, how do you explain interactions with DCM? So here we have um, a GLM where you have a stimulus and a task. And if you wanted to try to model these same effects using DCM, then you would have the stimulus still being present, except you're only assuming it goes into X1 here. And you're looking at uh, the effects of the task, which would be a modulatory input. 
So we're going to look at this in an example. So we have this model here. We're assuming the stimulus comes into X1. <coughs> and you have these two tasks that are going to um, be your modulatory input. So again, this is you know our, our example of uh, tension. So when the stimulus is applied at first, and this is in task A, you can see that um, uh, the sti second stimulus is smaller than the first. And um, you see the same patterns for both of these. But then when you see uh, X2, though, um, when you are applying the second task, not only are these signals smaller, but it seems to be the, uh, more uh, greatly expressed in X2. And again, this was from similar to the example we saw before, where if you have something that is getting um, twice the input from it, um, or getting a stronger input from it, then it's going to have a stronger um, decrease in signal seen from it. And this is what the same data looks like when you do just some added noise. So DCM parameters, how do we um, understand these DCM parameters? So these DCM parameters are rate constants, which basically means that they are unbounded. So if you integrate, um, remember when we're doing the DCM model, you're looking at the change of activity with respect to time. So if you um, integrate these, what you get out is an exponential function. So integrating a first order linear differential equation gives out an exponential function. And the coupling parameter then is inversely proportional to the half-life tau of z of t. So the coupling parameter describes the speed of the exponential change in x of t. So it describes really how quickly the signal um, decays and changes with respect to time and with respect to the um, other inputs that are coming into the system. So when you're interpreting DCM parameters, um, uh, it's a dynamic model, so you have your differential equations. Uh, neural parameters correspond to rate constants, which are measured in hertz. And tau is the speed at which effects take place. So um, the scaling of the parameters are all um, very similar because what you're doing is you factor out uh, your matrix, you factor out sigma, which is the connection of something with respect to itself. So you can compare different parameters from uh, A, Bs, and Cs matrix with each other because you are basically normalizing them. And each parameter then, what you're doing is you're characterizing it at the end by its mean and covariance of its a posteriori distribution. And then you can compare its mean against its chosen threshold. So, I think we've already gone over the problem of hemodynamic convolution. But what, what one thing that um, I'm extremely interested in my research is looking at these assumptions that go into these different models. And um, one thing that I became very concerned about earlier on was the effect of um, the hemodynamic response on the GLM analyses and what this would mean if the hemodynamic response wasn't properly estimated. So as you know, when you do a GLM analysis, what you're doing is you're looking for the expected response with, with, with um, respect to a given hemo or you're looking for the expected response with respect to a fixed HRF. So you're assuming, for example, that the hemodynamic response is going to be consistent uh, across ages, across diseases, across locations. Um, and this is something that we know isn't true. And there is a problem with this then because what you're doing when you're passing your data through the wrong filter is you're missing a lot of activations in groups that have different HRFs. So for example, when you're looking at aging populations, if you're assuming that the HRF is consistent if I am 20 or if I am 80, then it's going to look like your 80-year-olds are showing a lot less activation when really it's going to be a lot of vascular changes that are driving it. So this is actually something that I'm working on. And this was another reason I became interested in um, DCM was because of the ability to estimate what the hemodynamic parameters are within DCM, which you're not really able to do well, able to do well within, FMR, within GLM models. So the hemodynamic model in DCM has six different hemodynamic parameters. Um, and they're important for model fitting, but usually of no interest for statistical inference, unless you're me. And they're computed separately for each area. So what you do when you run a DCM is you're actually getting out HRF parameters for different areas. And um, about two years ago, I uh, ran a massively underpowered study that was looking at the HRF and methamphetamine abuse. And even though um, the sample size was small and we had very strict priors, on um, on the HRF functions, we were able to still identify some pretty interesting differences that were associated with methamphetamine abuse in the HRF. So 
Uh, the hemodynamic model, though, I, I assume you guys have already gone over this, but um, basically what you're doing is you're passing your expected stimulus through um, a bunch of different steps, including um, the vasodilatory signal, flow induction, changes in volume, changes in deoxyhemoglobin, and then you get out this very beautiful model of what you expect your response to be if you apply a stimulus. So there is something we have to be concerned about, though, because when you're working on a DCM model, what you're getting out is an estimation of what your connectivity parameters are in your A, B, and C matrices, but you're also getting out an estimate of what your hemodynamic parameters are. So then there can be the issue of whether or not you're estimating too much. If I, for example, um, jitter my A matrix by just a little, am I going to get out completely different parameters for my hemodynamics? And the answer to that is mostly no. Um, for the most part, your A, Bs, and Cs, you're able to estimate with confidence. There's not going to be a lot of um, uh, collinearity in what your estimates come out to be. But if you're looking at your, um, your matrix that is of the hemodynamic parameters, these six, um, there is some covariance between them because obviously a lot of the things, so for example, like um, blood flow and blood volume are going to be highly correlated. So it's going to be hard to uh, reliably estimate both of those. Um, so what I believe SPM does is it fixes three of them and it estimates the other three. So you have, uh, and you have very strong priors on things that um, try to inform um, what you actually need to estimate. And so you aren't actually estimating things unless you absolutely have to. So the parameter estimations, combining the neural and hemodynamic states gives the complete forward model. An observation model, this is down here, includes a measurement, error, and confound. So for example, you have what your observed signal is as a function of your stimuli plus your theta matrix, which you've estimated. And you also have things such as drift, this could be, and your error. And they do the Bayesian parameter estimation by means of the levenberg marquette gradient ascent, and it's embedded into an EM algorithm. And what you get out is your Ga Gaussian a posteriori parameter distribution and it's characterized by the mean and the covariance. So I, I believe uh, you guys have been hearing lots of um, complaints against frequency statistics this week, and if I criticize p-values once more, your ears might bleed. But um, just to uh, go over the big idea, though, that um, when you are doing frequency statistics, you are looking for the probability of getting the data given the model, and Bayesian is looking for the probability of the model instead giving the data. So this is another, this is the difference between um, the GLM and DCM right here. We're actually making inference on what the model is and not what how likely we were to see that data. So Bayes' theorem describes how an ideally rational person processes information. And uh, I'm not sure how many ideally rational per people we all know, but we can uh, assume still that Bayes' theorem is gonna be the best way to do it. So in Bayes' theorem, then you have your likelihood and your prior, and you multiply those together, divide by the evidence, and you get out your posterior distribution. And this likelihood, again, would be um, the GL emish analysis. So in Bayesian statistics, then, what you're doing is you are um, trying to incorporate your new data with your prior knowledge. So what you're really doing is saying that you're acknowledging um, that perhaps there is random variability in the data, and you're trying to ground and center yourself on what you believe to be true. So you have your prior distribution, which is really what you think should the ground truth should be, and you allow yourself to be convinced by new data, but not completely convinced. So for example, we have here some of the equations to show how it works. You have your prior distribution, and you're assuming the parameter is centered, for example, around 10, and your likelihood. So you've got some very extreme data that said this parameter really should be a 25. And instead of, for example, just running with um, what the likelihood says, what you're really doing is getting out your posterior distribution and saying, well, um, because the prior times the likelihood is a little bit more of an average, you're going to take some value that's closer to here as what your parameter should be. So Bayes' theorem allows one to formally incorporate prior knowledge into computing statistical probabilities. And the priors can be different uh, sorts, principled, uh, empirical, or shrinkage priors. And um, we'll go over into that in a little bit more in just a second. But the posterior probability of the parameters given the data is an optimal combination of prior knowledge and new data weighted by the relative precision. So principles of Bayesian inference, we have the likelihood function, the probability of your data given the model. We have your prior distribution, so the probability of the model, and the observation of data. And then you're updating your beliefs based upon your observations. So that's where the multiplication is. That's how you get between the green and blue when you arrive at the red at the end. <coughs> 
So the priors um, in DCM, they're needed for Bayesian estimation. So anytime you do Bayesian analysis, you have to have some sort of prior um, to uh, base your estimation upon. And they express our belief about the parameters of the model. So for example, hemodynamic prior murders would be empirical priors. And this would be, for example, um, what you assume the rate flow constant should be. Uh, temporal scaling, that's an example of a principled prior. And then uh, coupling parameters, those could be an example of a shrink of prior. So for example, you might uh, assume that there's not really any relationship between two regions. And you would set that uh, basically at zero and have to be very, very convinced by the data that there is any sort of connection between these two regions. So um, we'll just cover a little bit about shrinkage priors. So shrinkage priors, um, we can show how the different priors affect uh, what your posterior distribution is. So here you have your um, prior here, the green one, which remains the same. And the only thing that's changing here is your likelihood. So if you have, um, if you have, for example, a greater effect than you estimated, but it's very variable. So for example, let me say, let's say I, um, well, we can use any sort of example. Let's say I was measuring heights of people in a kindergarten class, and for example, they were all turned out to be six feet tall. Um, well, I, well, one was six foot tall, and the rest were uh, a lot shorter. You might have a very variable distribution, and you don't want to uh, run away with your new data and say that the average height of a you know six year old is um, five foot nine, because um, you're going to uh, you have a lot of variance. So what you're doing then when you're looking at your priors, you're not taking just into account where it's centered, but you're taking into account its spread. And if something has a very wide spread, it's going to have less an effect on what happens to your posterior distribution. So right here you see that this has a wide variance, so there's very little difference between the prior and the posterior distribution. Similarly, if you have um, another large and variable effect, even though this is still variable because it's larger, you have a little bit more movement up here. And um, down here, what you see is when you have um, less variable effects. So all of your measurements were within a, s within a range that you would have expected it to be. And because of this, you're going to see a greater difference between here and here than between here and here. So these two are both centered at the same place, but the only difference between them is their variability. So that's why you have a greater movement between here and here. And it's the same thing right here. So basically, though, when you're doing um, Bayesian analysis, it's not just the center that measures, me matters, excuse me, it's also the spread. So when you're doing DCM, you're making inference about the parameters. And so, for example, in a single subject analysis, you're making assumptions about the posterior distributions of the parameters. So use of the cumulative dis normal distribution to test the probability that a certain parameter is above a threshold, gamma. So what you're doing then is you're coming up with this distribution after you do, do your DCM, and then you can come up with an actual measurement of what is the probability that my parameter is greater than zero. So this is an example of a DCM that was done before, and what they're trying to do is trying to figure out the probability of a um, connection. So looking at C, let's see which one that is. Um, but they ran the DCM, and they got out that there was this, um, this distribution, and these priors are centered around zero, but because of the data, it got moved up. And so then the question was, what is the probability that these two regions are coupled? Whether well, you look at the probability that your C parameter is greater than zero, given your data. And so you're actually getting out a probability of the parameter being, or the, the probability of this connection existing. So if you're trying to make inference about DCM parameters, you can th use things like Bayesian fixed effects group analyses. And what this is, is um, combining posterior distributions um, to kind of come up with, n not necessarily an average, but conceptually similar to it about what your posterior should be. So because of likelihood distributions from different subjects are independent, when you're trying to make inference about the parameters, you can combine them by kind of, uh, it's almost like daisy chaining them together. Um, you start off with one of your priors, and then you feed it into the next subject, and you keep feeding it on until you multiply them all out. And um, so under Gaussian assumptions, this is pretty easy to compute. You have your group posterior covariance and your individual posterior covariances, and then you come up with uh, a mean in the end. So what if, for example, you had different models that you were interested in, and you weren't absolutely certain which sort of model you should be working on? So for that, you can use Bayesian model selection. So given competing hypotheses on structure and functional mechanisms of a system, which model is best? 
Now this is a problem because we know very well that the more parameters you include in a model, the better it looks. And this is where overfitting uh, comes around. So for example, on this bottom, uh, these bottom images right here, we see this little curve. And here we have just a linear function we're trying to fit it with. It's OK. Uh, then you can fit it with this uh, curve. It's a little bit better. But then when you put a much higher order function, it looks like you get every single point. So you're predicting perfectly what your observations are. So good for you. Perfect prediction. Uh, but the problem with that, though, is you're overfitting, though. When you try your model out on new data, chances are it's going to be not very well, not perform well. So Bayesian model selection, then, is a way of accounting for um, both overfitting in the data, so the number of parameters you're including, and the actual fit of the data. And it uh, helps you assess which model best represents the balance between model fit and the model complexity. And for which model does the probability of the data be uh, given the model become maximal? So this is based on um, Bayes' rule, and you're looking at the model evidence. So Bayes' rule um, is looking at the parameters of the model, or trying to predict the likelihood of the parameters given the data. And the model evidence is the probability of the data given the model. And it accounts for both accuracy and the complexity of the model, and allows for inference about structure or generalizability of the model. And so what you're actually doing then when you're comparing uh, different models using Bayes' factor is you're comparing the likelihood of the data given the model, but you're um, looking at a ratio between them. So you're comparing two models to each other. And there are a few ways to do this, um, things like free energy, AIC, and BIC. Uh, free energy is a much stronger framework for doing this, because when you're looking at free energy, what you're also doing is you're accommodating for the covariance among the parameters. So for Bayes factors, to compare two models, we can just compare the log of their evidence. But the log evidence by itself is just a number. And so to make it a little bit more interpretable, what you actually do is you compare the ratios between the two models. So which model is more plausible than the other? Um, and so you do that, you get Bayes factor. And so here is um, kind of a rough guide on the bottom right to kind of analyze how strong your Bayes factor has to be. So if I'm comparing models one and two, um, then you would want to have a value probably of, I mean, hopefully over 20 to try to make sure that model one really is superior to model two because the evidence for it is so much greater. So here are some examples of uh, studies, DCM for fMRI. And um, there's uh, a new study that I'm going to be doing very shortly, working with Susan Bookheimer, who uh, I believe uh, Elizabeth said previously that uh, Susan was her role model. She's also mine, so I just want to say that. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to be doing a new study involving DCM of Alzheimer's disease um, with Susan soon. So that's all I have for right now. Um, I we believe we said that we're going to hold questions until the end. So if we have any time, you guys can go ahead and get coffee. And then after Dr. Douglas speaks, then we will try to uh, do a group questions because there's probably going to be a lot of overlapping questions. And she's going to be going over DCM as well. Um, does anyone have the time? Mark? So do we have time for a break before Pamela? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you.